Welcome everyone. So um, all the early adopters. <laughs> um, this is a, absolutely a fascinating panel. We've got Mark Crager to thank for this. He's one of our advisors and suggested the panel. And I'm absolutely so interested after interviewing uh, all the panellists. Um, firstly, what I'd like to do though is um, one of the panellists, Joe Barton, has come up from LA and he's one of the Shepherd Mullen attorneys and he's actually going to host tonight. So I'm just going to get him to say a few words. Of course. Thank you. Uh, hi everybody, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Welcome to Shepherd Mullen, San Francisco. It's much better than uh, downtown Los Angeles, which I'm sure you guys have all been there. We have pretty views here and all that. Um, I hope this is a really helpful panel for you. As an attorney for Shepherd Mullen, um, my firm has gotten into representing some marijuana related businesses. And the idea there is that everybody needs compliance advice, no matter what line of business you're in. You probably need advice and we want to help you to get it. And coming to panels like this, that's why we sponsor them. We think, you know, there's more than just legal advice. There's business advice, there's investment advice, a lot of different things you need to consider. Um, and we're hoping to get people thinking about it. And as bigger players get in the space, law firms get in the space and start working with marijuana related businesses, we hope that really helps legitimize the industry and kind of brings it into the mainstream. So thank you for attending and uh, I hope this is helpful. Thanks, Joe. If anyone wants to talk to Joe, you can catch him after the panel. Um, and we're having one pitch after the panel, so you've got almost half an hour. Um, so now I'm going to pass it on over to Mark, and Mark's going to introduce the panelists. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much, panel, and thanks everybody for coming tonight. This was, uh, I'd say, a little bit of a stretch, not because there isn't an interest in the category, but uh, trying to surface that interest into a group that typically focuses on uh, fintech and how does fintech and, uh, and the cannabis industry fit in together. Um, I uh, am managing partner for Next Stage Partners. We focus on helping companies in the fintech space launch their product from a concept uh, to full commercialization, working with banks, credit unions, and the like. Um, has nothing to do with cannabis. And so my interest here tonight is strictly from a business perspective, and I look at this as one of the largest opportunities for growth, for revenue, uh, for creation of jobs, you name it. And it never ceases to amaze me. I'll let Charlie introduce himself, but he was probably my first lead in from a business perspective. Um, and I'll let him talk about his company, but I've got uh, folks that I know that are developing clean rooms and they work in the high tech space. And I said, are you doing growth facilities? Yes. Are you doing anything in the cannabis space? Well, yeah, but we don't really talk about it. And there was kind of this undercurrent of, well, it's legal business, but we're kind of acting like it's illegal. Um, and I don't think that's acceptable. I think it's stupid. Um, I've got another friend of mine that is in chemical testing and actually tests crops. Testing cannabis is one of their biggest industries. Um, another friend of mine is in insurance and actually introduced me to Stacy, and he looks at it as the largest opportunity he'll see in his lifetime right now relative to the revenue that can, can generate from this. Um, some of the statistics we'll throw out tonight and people can kind of verify, but my understanding is only 3% of the crop in California is actually regulated through the taxation system the taxation, which is about 40% on the crop. That 40% does a lot of things for the state. It generates a lot of revenue, it creates a lot of jobs, it builds a lot of roads, it helps fund schools, everything that's good for the community. None of these stories are really getting out. Um, you hear more about cannabis being a gateway drug and things like that. If people understood how regulated the crop of cannabis is, and you compare that to the lack of regulations on, say, something like Oxycontin and how easy it is to get that prescription, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous that we don't have better awareness from the usage piece. So I'd love for the, the panel tonight to share their experiences relative to how they're involved, why they're involved in this, in this, uh, in this industry. I'd really like to shed light on it so that if we have another session like this next year or further down the road, we are spreading word from people from an investment community, you look at the institutional side of people that want to invest in, in this business that don't know how to do it or are afraid to do it. How do we bring those people into the fold and how do we really legitimize what's already a legal business? So I'm going to pass the mic down. First one is Stacy Jackson. 
Hi everyone, I'm Stacy Jackson. I'm general counsel for Golden Bear Insurance Company, and we're the first admitted insurance carrier covering cannabis cultivation, manufacturing, um, dispensaries, and um, we were invited by the insurance commissioner, Dave Jones, to a meeting probably last October and um, in that meeting there were people from the cannabis industry saying please help we're trying to get insurance we can't find insurance and um, there were a lot of players around that table a lot of big companies um, a lot of um, folks that uh, have headquartered out of state and um, we met with uh, cultivators and and people from weed maps and and um, other growers and folks who'd been in the industry for a long time and they said please come see what we're doing and we took them up on that offer and what we found was that there are a lot of um, incredibly bright professional people in this industry um, they are organic chemists and they are um, they know what they're doing and they are ready um, and willing and able to be compliant. Um, these are sound operations, um, and we just um, felt that as an insurance company that normally writes um, bars and restaurants and trampoline parks, talk about a risk, I'll take cannabis all day long. So um, that's how we got involved in it, but I do want to speak to the reputational risk piece really quick yeah. and and we were concerned about that and um, we have not felt a backlash at all it's been our experience that um, we have really embraced the social purpose behind this regulation and feel very good about it um, there are a lot of good things that are happening um, because of the legalization of marijuana in this state and um, we're, we're really proud to be a part of that Hi, uh, my name is Charlie Wilson. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at a company called GreenBits. Uh, we provide kind of retail point of sale and compliance management software to the dispensary side of the equation. Uh, we've got about a thousand dispensaries across 11 states. Um, we're actually fairly underrepresented in California at the moment. We've only recently entered the state, even though we're domiciled here. Uh, we handle about approaching two and a half billion dollars in sales through our registers each year. Um, so a lot of cash, and, and we're just getting started. Um, my own personal story, I come from the, the fintech world. Um, my wife's a small business owner. My interest in this industry was um, you know, along those two dimensions, helping small business owners and um, seeing the opportunity and the, and the lack of kind of financial services available to these parties. Um, and we're trying to kind of bring that legitimacy and credibility to the industry, kind of as was touched on. The irony is there's a lack of services, but there's arguably more control over this industry than any other industry out there between the state oversight and the banks that do provide banking services, their compliance oversight, there's a tremendous amount of control. Um, I think there's just a catching up that the rest of the world needs to do to, to bring that to bear. Excited to be here, thanks. Hi, I'm Mark Denzen. My company's uh, CDMS. What we do is compliant banking. And you'll, you'll hear that a lot from the panel tonight because that's exactly what we're here to do is extend this business and make it compliant all the way from the seed to sale process B2B space and, and everywhere that it goes because really what we're taking on here is the ability for institutional investors to come in and realize that this is you know great people. I mean, if, if you know uh, anybody in the industry from a, from a grower to a dispensary owner, their families just like us, they're here, they're entrepreneurs, they're super excited about a product that actually has major health benefits when you talk THC, CBD, and, and other derivatives of the products. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. So, well, we really stepped in here to, to legitimize that legal business from a banking perspective. If you, if you don't know, uh, there's probably less than 2% of the industry is banked today, right? So these are all cash transactions, and there's literally three ways to move the money around. You've got Prince and Loomis armored car you see all around. You've got uh, hired mercenaries that you can have, or you can ride around the trunk of your car with $100,000. Um, none of those sound like great options for me. Uh, I don't do that in my, my, any other business I do. Why would I do that in this legal business as well, right? And one of the things is taking on the cost of that transportation method, right? And cost is risk. So if I'm riding around with $100,000 in my trunk and somebody knows it, it's a good chance that, you know, I'm a, I'm a target, 
for something that I don't want to have happen to me. Um, or if you have other guys that are, are going to be moving money around for you and somebody decides to take on that risk to confront those guys, nothing good's going to happen out of there. And then bring some Loomis, they're just expensive. So if there's easier ways, more compliant ways that we can move this value of, of money back and forth in order to have an ecosystem that's compliant. And uh, my name is Joe Barton. You already met me. Um, my background is a uh, white collar crime. That's where I come from. Um, in that world, you learn a lot about compliance, and you want you see people in bad situations, and you think if you just would have been compliant, if you just would have been transparent, if you just would have, you know, a lot of the times in the white collar world, it's not so much the substantive conduct that the government's investigating, it's some peripheral conduct that happened. Something, somebody covered something up, somebody lied on an application, somebody did something like that. Um, with that idea in mind, you know, I, marijuana was coming about two years ago, and um, in the law world, people don't know where, someone comes and wants marijuana related advice, and they don't know where to go, so they think white colored people. They have all kinds of weird stuff, so why not white color? So that's how I ended up. Um, which makes sense because I do like driving around with a hundred thousand dollars of cash in my car. That's generally, generally how I roll. Um, so from there, you know, even I, so two years ago, I've seen them from both sides, from enforcement actions um, by federal, state, and local authorities, all the way to companies that, from the very beginning, they want to try to do it right and avoid, avoid that enforcement action. Um, so I want to you know, get the word out there and say, you know, be compliant from the first instant. It might be hard, yeah. It, but sometimes it's hard to do. You may not get a bank right away. You might end up with a lot of cash. But there are answers to that, um, and very simple answers. You know, treat it for cash. Treat it like any other cash business, like car washes and all that. There are ways to handle cash in compliant ways, simple policies, procedures, and accounting things you do. You do that, you pay your taxes, you tell people who you are, and you act, don't act guilty, because you're not. You know, marijuana is becoming fully legal. Be happy, be proud of what you do, and um, get the advice you need, invest in the advice you need, whether it's legal, financial, uh, insurance. Um, I don't think it's as cost prohibitive as people think, and it will put you in a good position because I think going forward, uh, the people that are going to get in trouble in the marijuana industry are people that are going to are doing something wrong. It's like this peripheral misconduct. You're not paying your taxes. You're lying to banks. Um, you're doing something that violates the regulations on how you sell marijuana, like something that came up with the panel before we started was you're selling marijuana and packaging it with candy. Well, don't do that, right? Same thing with cigarettes. Don't package candy and cigarettes together. You can't do that. Um, so if you stay away from this peripheral misconduct, get the advice you need to make sure you stay away from it, I think you'll be okay. Um, and that's what we're here to help you do. Great, thanks. Um, I, I met Mark Denson for the first time in, down in San Diego in January, and I was like, I don't know if my mouth was hanging open when you were talking, but I'm just amazed at you know, some of the interactions you've had in the, in the business and some of the things you've done to help establish banks in, in the states where um, it's, it's legal for, for recreational. Um, the banks are really a, kind of a holding cell, and there's still a tremendous amount of restrictions on the money that's deposited in there. So I'd like uh, maybe, Mark, if you could grab the, the mic um, from Joe, but if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the things that you're doing in terms of the legalization of handling money and then how you see, uh, I think the general theme of this question is how do we get the federal government on board with the state and how do we you know, have them take a look at this and the benefits that this can bring and have it be treated like any of the other regulated businesses that exist perfectly well today? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's great to be part of this industry at this time too, because you know before there was a stigma around it's it's a drug, it's it's a gateway, it does all these different things, and then when it became actual medicine, that's that's when it really became that that product we're legalizing in California here. Now it's like 28 states. I mean, it's it's awesome to see what happens. So what we did is we developed a software that connected to the banks that did bank over the years and uh, connected systems like you know. Greenbits and and others that are out there in order to to comply with the seed to sale process. These are all rules that the government has already set. So there's nothing new that we're just making up or reinventing here. The government did set a, a set of guidelines for everybody to follow. You now, just like Charlie's company, we set up and how to follow those guidelines, and that's that's what we do. And and we've really worked hard from from a technology standpoint, from software to to lower the costs of of doing any money laundering check, fence in requirements, all fact checks. All those things are all part of exactly what we have to do here. And then we took it one step further this year as we took it to the blockchain market. 
Okay, so we tokenized the transactions and we tokenized the value of the money that you deposit in our bank in order to do B2B transactions in a compliant way. So when you come into my bank, you put a dollar in your account, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tokenize that piece. That token's gonna have all the information about you, the transaction, all the seed to sale information of how that dollar derived into my bank. Okay, and that's all a piece of it right there. And now it's in the bank, how do I spend it? And how do I utilize this again in a compliant way? Well, once we go and I, I've got a dollar and I want to give it to Charlie here, I, that information is going to be stored. His information is now going to be stored on the blockchain, on that token, and the reason for the transaction. So if the federal government wants to come in and ask us, hey, why did we do this transaction? Why did I give Charlie a dollar? Well, here's exactly why, and we can uncover that very easily. Or my own accounting firm or my law firm wants to, to review what am I doing every day, right? And that's a big piece. Or my insurance broker wants to understand what's what's my risk every day of the value of money that I'm moving over from one place to another. And that's really what's going to change the market for a lot of these folks. And, and again, we're, we're doing it at low cost, secure, and compliant. And that's probably the biggest thing. And that's what's going to bring the government uh, climbing on us, right? And when you talk about people now paying taxes, the government here in California has set aside $30 million to pay Brinks and Loomis to drive around everybody's uh, farms and dispensaries to collect their tax money. That's a lot of money that they're wasting on that. We can do that at no charge, and there's plenty of the companies that are going to be doing that right now. So you can pay your power bills and your your landlords and your payroll because right now payroll's almost 99% cash, right? And as an employee, you're like, oh sweet, I got cash. And when it comes tax time, and then it becomes a, a big burden for a lot of these folks, and they're carrying around a lot of cash. And, and that's, that's a big problem. So as the government realizes that we can do transactions in a compliant way that's regulated already today, they're gonna to realize in the Cole Memo, if you're familiar with the Cole Memo, that was what allowed states to, the ability to set their own laws in order to have legalization of marijuana for medical or recreational. That was rescinded this year. And I thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened to us because that's gonna force Congress in order to make decisions on how they're going to move forward with this industry, which we're not moving back. They're not going to say no more, no more of this because they like the, the tax base and they really enjoy you know, what it does from a health benefit perspective. Uh, just as they did in prohibition with alcohol, we're going to be doing that with, with marijuana. And that's, that's a big piece of why they're going to step in and why it's going to make a major impact on the economies and more importantly, the tax base that, that we invest back into. Thank you. Charlie, any comments in terms of what you see that could influence the federal government to, to line up with state? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I wish I had the, the you know, the, the crystal ball on that right. one. I would say kind of as, as you know, mentioned, 29 states in the District of Columbia have legalized. There are several more that are considering legalization. I think there's a number of different angles by which you can make the case. Um, there's job creation, tax revenue. There's, you know, it's not scientifically demonstrated yet, but certainly um, suggestive medical benefits, um, very little downside. Um, and probably more importantly, the public opinion is behind it. Um, if you go back to 1964, 12% of U.S. citizens supported legalization of cannabis. That number is now 64%, and it's the first time ever a majority of both political parties. There's not a topic or a politician that can get that level of support. So I think it's just a question of the federal government catching up with public opinion, um, and that, that momentum backed by the state seems to be you know, progressing in the right direction. Great. Um, Stacy, uh, a good friend of mine that's in the insurance business said nothing happens in business without insurance. You can't buy a house, you can't rent or buy a car, you can't open a business if you're not insured. So you talked about kind of uh, the concern of reputational risk, but how well do you think insurance um, you know, permeates the, the cannabis business right now? And are there people on the outside trying to get into the space that, that aren't aware that they can get insurance? I'm, um, I, no, no, I think that people who are setting up a business are looking for insurance. They're just, um, they're looking for appropriate coverage at the right price. Mm -hmm. And um, so it needs to make sense to them. And, um, and I think that's what we've provided with our product. So, so I think it's out there, um, but whether or not it's affordable, um, and has appropriate coverage is, is really important. And I think that, um, um, I don't think that there's businesses out there 
legitimate businesses, legal businesses that are that are running there. Um, but they're they may be struggling to um, to get appropriate coverage. So I, I wanted to bootstrap yeah. um, a little bit on the federal state issue. A lot of the reasons why insurers have been reluctant to get into um, covering cannabis businesses is because a lot of insurance companies are also reinsured. Um, and their reinsurance partners are outside of the state of California. So you, again, it, it, whenever you have that interstate issue, you, you have the federal question. And so we look very hard at the, the federal state issue. And it was really interesting to me because I found other industries that were federally illegal that could be insured. So for example, the um, the Bunny Farm mm -hmm. in Nevada, um, Obamacare covers um, the women working there. Um, there is insurance coverage federally for those states that have passed um, assisted suicide right to die laws, mm -hmm. and um, so that's kind of interesting to me too because um, federally that's illegal. So this isn't the first industry necessarily to be um, where you can insure a business that might not be legal at a federal level. Um, the other thing I thought was really interesting is um, the federal government really, I mean, they collect taxes from these yes. businesses. I mean, to me, that's the height of hypocrisy here. And they tax them at a very high rate. There was a bill introduced recently to reduce that rate, and um, it didn't pass. In fact, it was withdrawn because there wasn't enough support by the bill's author because they felt that um, there would be, it, it wouldn't go anywhere. Why? Because the federal government really likes getting all that tax money from the cannabis industry. So I thought that was really interesting. We also know that, um, I believe it's the FDA that owns um, the patent on one of the, and that's through the US Patent um, Office, on um, one of the uh, cannabinoid um, products. We also know that just recently, last week or the week before, the FDA approved um, a, um, a a CBD product for use with children with epilepsy. It's the first that's out on the market. So the federal government is coming around. We know that Jeff Sessions is out there arming um, the federal prosecutors with the authority to, um, to enforce um, the Controlled Substances, Substances Act, but the practical reality of it, as you mentioned, Charlie, is that the horses left the barn here. You've got thousands of people employed in this industry. The tax revenues are too good for the states. They're too good for the feds. Nobody's dying from overdosing on marijuana. It's not like the opioid crisis. In fact, studies are showing that people who, who take marijuana are less likely to use opioids. We've got crime statistics that say on those border states to Mexico that have legalized marijuana. We've got violent crimes going down. There's just two, if this is a, this is a snowball that is just, it's, it's, um, it's going to be too big to stop. It's too big. So the horses left the barn. The horses um, left the, the barn. The snowball is coming down the hill. Oh, and we were talking thank earlier, you very much, uh, right. The toothpaste is already out of the tube. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, John Borner, uh, former secretary of the House um, in Ohio, uh, recently uh, was announced that he's become part of a, a lobbying group yes. for, for cannabis. And I think it probably gave a few people in the Midwest uh, heart murmurs. But... Um, I thought it was fascinating, and I rarely post, I could probably count on one hand, uh, on Facebook, and all I said was, it would be great if the state and federal governments could come together on this topic. And I didn't really say that I was a for or against it, I was purposely neutral, and I immediately, within five minutes, probably got two posts, and one was from a 
prolific poster on Facebook. And also, like, I probably need to, to disconnect them uh, from my feed so I don't have to read everything they have to say. But they came out immediately, as I would have expected, that uh, they were just absolutely over the top in favor of this. And I'm like, okay, that's really not the kind of support I was hoping for. Um, and then on the other side, almost immediately after her, was a gentleman that I know that is in the federal judicial system uh, that quickly, as though he had been cutting and pasting this previously, posted about eight paragraphs of how states are required to follow federal rules and laws. So, so but, uh, along that, but, but, but comment. So what, what's yeah. really interesting there is probably a month ago, there was a um, a, a man and a wife who have who have children who suffer from epilepsy, and they sued the federal government for the right to um, allow their children to have this marijuana product that would um, protect them um, to protect their health. The judge in that case said the court said that. Um, Marijuana has probably saved your child's life. However, I don't have the ability to legislate um, this right now at a federal level. And so dismiss the case. Now, the FDA has approved this drug. So it's, this is curious to me. Yeah. So the solution is happening with or without Congressional approval, but there are bills lined up. Um, Booker um, is the name of the senator, I believe, who's got a really interesting. Um, is it Booker? Yeah, Corey T. Booker. Yes. Booker, yes. New Jersey. Yes, he's got a really good plan. The Justice Act, I believe, they're calling it, and it is. It's very comprehensive, and it talks about um, not just um, decriminalizing. Um, marijuana, but it also talks about putting this mon that money back into communities, um, expunging records, um, hitting reset on a lot of the damage that has occurred uh, to people and to communities who've had to suffer through um, the harm of, of illegalization. So um, I just it's a really fascinating time. You almost have to watch it every single day to um, see what's going on. Yeah. Um, being true to the theme of the uh, structure here, this is FinTech Silicon Valley. Uh, it's hard to talk about FinTech when there's not a lot of investment and VCs that are usually uh, congregated around this room and, and startups. So I haven't had a chance to meet everybody that's in the crowd. We'll go to Q&A in a little bit. But I, I kind of appreciate the panel and maybe um, Joe start with you and just kind of work our way this way on companies that you may have um, already spoken with um, or uh, that you know that might be interested in investing in this business and feel hamstrung. Um, you know, what, basically I'm trying to figure out how do we get the folks that are interested, that are standing on the edge of the pool, into the pool? Sure. So I've worked with a, I'll say a handful of companies, um, it's not many, that, that want to invest in the marijuana space. Um, and you know there are fewer companies that want to invest in actual marijuana grows. Usually it's some kind of ancillary business, whether it's providing power to marijuana, building greenhouses for marijuana, um, you name it. Um, you'll find someone that's probably interested in it. And everybody is, you know, kind of their concern. Their first concern is, is marijuana still federally illegal, which Okay, you should know that and be aware of that. Um, the other concern is there's a lot of cash, and cash always has a bad stigma to it. They like, there's a lot of cash. What do I do with this cash? Um, and talking to these people, you know, the way kind of my job is to advise them, yes, it is federally illegal, so I, we can't take away all the risk. You know, I, I can never say that. What I can tell you is based on my experience, um, I have not seen any enforcement actions for people just selling marijuana. Um, federal enforcement actions that I've seen have been for not paying your taxes or evading taxes. Um, and based on what I know today, that's what the federal government's ramping up to do here in California, is they're going to go after marijuana companies and see what you're doing on your taxes. Okay. And I think the thinking behind that is no one wants to have a fight that marijuana is bad. That's too, it's not going to win the court of public opinion. Um, the government doesn't want that fight. But what everybody can get behind is if you're selling marijuana and not paying your taxes, well, I pay my taxes, everybody else pays their taxes, people aren't going to like you. 
So I think that's kind of the angle the federal government's going to take. Um, so that's step one is to kind of get you comfortable with where I think enforcement is going. And then two is, what do you look for? Um, people think it's marijuana, and I want to invest in marijuana, and you know, these people are telling me they don't have anything to document their company, I can't do diligence. Well, that's not the case. You, know, you should be able to go there and diligence a company just like you would diligence any investment. Um, if they have cash, how do you handle your cash? Give me your policies and procedures for that. That's not hard, right? Car washes have done it for years. Um, do you have banking? No, okay, I understand. You may not be able to get banking, but have you been truthful with the banks that you've worked with? Um, why haven't you got banking? Have you looked into other solutions? They are out there. Um, and if you look not all that hard, you can find banks that will work with you, especially in major cities like LA or San Francisco. There are banks that will work with you. And if you're a savvy investor um, and you have, you know, uh, good structure in place, good policy procedures, uh, great accounting. You know, banks want to work with you. They're not going to turn away the money. Um, you know, and the more so that, that that's not well known, right? How how does that something like that that story permeate? I mean, folks like yourself, obviously, that are dealing with these companies that have come to you, but how how do we educate the general public on that? To, to from a business perspective, I'm a, I'm a VC, and I want to start an agricultural fund, and I've got. Hundred million dollars or two hundred, whatever that number is. How do how do I feel good about you know searching this out and maybe coming to somebody like yourself and, and getting into this space? I think uh, the first step is to say just to sit down with someone that works in this space and say what should I look for? What are the hallmarks of a good marijuana investment? What should I, based on what we know, based on what I know, my experience or my colleagues, what should I look for? And say well, here are the five factors you should consider. Right? Is this person do they have policies and procedures? They have insurance. Are they trying to get insurance? Are they trying to do things the right way? You know, if they're doing cash, are they reporting, filing their 8300s to the IRS? You know, the IRS isn't going after people based on 8300 reports. It's for not filing the 8300s, which is required for any cash payment. Um, the second step is just really become familiar with the enforcement environment. Um, I could refer you to local enforcement officials that I know that will tell you that they're not going after marijuana. You know, they're going after the bad peripheral conduct around it. Who's selling marijuana to kids, right? Is there anybody out there with the ice cream truck that sells marijuana to kids at school grounds? That's who I want. They don't want the stand-up marijuana shop. Um, and, you know, they certainly don't want the peripheral businesses where more of the investment is going, like you supply power to marijuana companies. Okay, great. You probably supply power to a lot of other companies. Are you... To the extent you can, are you making sure the marijuana companies that you give power to are doing things by the books? Yeah, you know, you're asking the right questions. You're asking, you know, are they following the regs? Are they licensed? And you, you're trying to get the best responses you can. It's not a perfect system, but you're you're trying, right? Like you are in any diligence. Um, if you can do that, I think that's you know, that should give you pretty good comfort that this that that, that it will be okay. You know, Jeff Sessions is not going to come head hunting for you. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Mark, you could uh, talk for hours in terms of some of the fingers you have in different pies relative to, to financial opportunity for this. So if I came to you and I said I had X number of dollars and I really wanted to get into the space, what, where do you see a, a good investment? How would you direct those funds? Yeah, I look at a lot of these funds that I talked to today. My background is private equity and venture capital, so I've been doing that for about five years for infrastructure. And I, I talk to a lot of groups like U.S. Bank or private family funds and, and a few other larger uh, pension funds that want to get in this space, and they don't understand the risk that's there, right? And that's all investment really is. It's, it's risk mitigation. And that's having the proper insurance, the proper attorneys, proper banking solutions, and more importantly, the proper internal pieces that are going to track it all the way through. And you should feel comfortable that those pieces are in place today. And it's and it's so difficult for some people to, to realize that. And so I've talked to some funds recently, and uh, you know, we're looking at what, what do you like to invest in today? Is it real estate? Okay, great. Let's, let's start with real estate in the cannabis market. Let's start with energy in the cannabis market. You're already doing that today as your natural investment. Why don't you just carry that on over to this piece? And there's going to be, uh, you know, words around the street that that uh, cannabis growers are going to have to be off grid coming by 2020. Uh, right now, they use three to four percent of the state's power in order to to uh, produce marijuana. Now, per perspective, about five percent of the state's power is used to power all the streetlights in the entire state. Okay, so you see that that uses quite a bit of energy. Uh, they're going to be able to take those groups off grid. And that's what's really going to be taxing the grid today. You know, PG&E and, and SoCal Ed, they can't afford to put another billion dollar investment into more power generation. And a lot of the problem is, is because of regulation. So how can we offset that with solar, 
wind, very clean solutions, battery backup, gas turbines, those types of energy uh, power units are, are great investments for a lot of private equity firms. Uh, you have real estate, you can just become a, a landowner and your tenants just happen to grow marijuana. And there's a few big ones that are in, uh, in the state, one's Canna Hub here. Uh, they do a great job, a million plus square feet of space that they're simply a real estate group that developed uh, a platform for people to grow uh, marijuana and do their business. You know, uh, Another one in Oregon, Dewey Farms. Uh, again, trying to professionalize a professional industry that isn't always looked that way. And, and I think as an investor or investment group, you should really take a look at some of what's gonna happen here in the future. And that's that's where people are gonna start taking the groups public. You know, right now you can take companies public on the Canadian exchange, you can't do it today in the US. Uh, that's gonna change sooner or later. Uh, all the big money is going to come in once once it's determined that they feel safe. And I think that you know, people like us and, and people like yourself that are here, and thank you for being here, are, are really making a difference and making that change. And it's, it's, a, it's a revolution of, of an industry that's, that's pretty amazing. Okay. Charlie, I've got 200 million. I want to bring into the cannabis space. How, how can I do it safely? Where should I go? In passing retails. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I'd say buyer beware. Like, do your diligence first of all, um, because there are, you know, there's there's a green rush, and I think you know you've got to be intelligent about what you look at. Um, Joe touched on the point, the distinction between a plant touching business and an ancillary business. We're a software company. Um, we face some of the same challenges challenges that our customers do getting services, ironically. But mm -hmm. um, kind of look at that. I, I guess you know our experience, not so much where you would invest or where you place your money. But our experience, there's definitely a lot of high net worth money out there. There's a little bit of institutional money specific to the cannabis industry. Um, that's kind of the path that we took. Um, we were fortunate very recently to get a, a very large, you know, traditional institutional investor behind us. But it was a, it was a tough road to get there. Um, we, we had a lot of, um, you know, we're a technology company. We've, we've worked with technology VCs in the past. They're interested in the returns, um, but they're challenged to get this past their LPs. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a difficult environment. Um, and I think you know, it's relaxing. Um, the banner announcement, the, you know, kind of the continued momentum behind the industry will bring the people on the sidelines off the sidelines, um, but it's, it's still a battle for sure. Stacy, any investment suggestions? Well, sure. I think that um, in terms of the safety of the investment, the um, other thing that we would look at is the Rohrbach Amendment to the spending bill. Right now, there are no federal funds to raid um, a medicinal dispensary. So um, I thought that that, um, that was renewed by Congress recently, and it, it remains in effect until September 30th, 2018. And um, well, that gives. Sorry, what, what, what is that? The Rohrbach Amendment is just a provision in the spending bill that says there is no money for federal enforcement of the um, the Controlled Substances 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 Act. And and what's interesting about that is um, here locally, just across the bay um, in Oakland, there was a a raid um, against Harborside. Um, this was back in 2016, and the Lower Block Amendment was in place in the spending bill, and um, the attorneys for Harborside argue that um, you can't raid us. There's, there is a prohibition against spending any federal monies to, to raid us, and they were, they were successful. Um, and, and that's a Ninth Circuit case that you can take a look at. But again, it only applies to um, medicinal. And as that amendment comes up for renewal every year, again, it's subject to um, Congress including it in. Hopefully we'll get something more permanent, but that was at least better than just a memo um, as to whether or not we were gonna be hands off. So, um, so I think that that gives um, investors a safety net of sorts. And then, of course, insurance. If the place burns down, Golden Bear Insurance Company is going to cover it if they're one of our insureds. So, um, okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on is um, the way that the media will spin stories. 
And I'm not suggesting that if you guys are supportive of the growth in the cannabis space that we should be actively um, calling news agencies and suggesting storylines for them. But I think it's important to really understand the facts when you hear a story told. And that 3 to 4% on the power grid is an interesting number. Um, and there's a couple ways to look at that. Is that a good number or is it a bad number? If, if, if all the grow facilities came online that needed to be powered, would that, would that number jump to 7%? Would it be 12%? Um, and then you say, okay, so it's 3 to 4%. What do those grow facilities uh, produce that is good for the state? So how much of how many three or four crops a year uh, in a grow facility? What is the tax uh, revenue that's generated off of those crops, and how is that in, in digested by society? And how did, how does the state benefit from that? Mark, I know one of the investment opportunities that you talked about was uh, street lights that um, are solar, wind, and battery powered. And for in Mexico, I won't go into all the details, but I just remember verbatim in our conversation, street lights that generate power and can fire back into the grid of a city and generate a sizable percentage of the city's need on electricity. Much more valuable in Mexico based on the, the rates of electricity, but if we're talking about a business that could theoretically generate a lot of tax revenue, meeting the power grid and it's being compared to street lights, how do we reduce the, the power needed to power street lights and make those a, a better investment for the environment? And there's a lot of ways to spin the story, but any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we can look at so many different ways from infrastructure investment to reduce energy consumption. And, and it means a lot to everybody what it is. It's not just pollution anymore. It's, it's, it's physically can, can change the the landscape of, of most towns and cities, and you talk about street lights. You know, what I focus one of the things I do is I focus on smart city investments. And smart city means a lot to to folks that are understanding that uh, you know we're we're addicted to cell phones and communication and have that right. Good, bad, or indifferent. It's it allows you know people like me to travel every day and still be at work every minute, which is not good for my daughter or you know people like that, but. Uh, but when, when you look at where we can change this market and we can take the money that we make off of this type of revenue, whether it be tax revenue or just, just positive investment that, that we created, uh, putting that back into the industry itself, uh, the federal government doesn't have any money. State government doesn't have any money. I work with a lot of schools and municipalities that don't have any money. The only way for them to get more money is coming out of your pocket. And, and I don't think we want that to happen. And so we can literally leverage an industry like this and in order to stop government from taking money out of our pocket and reinvesting that money that we're already paying in taxes from that perspective. And that's, that's really one of my goals in, in the future here is really change on how uh, infrastructure investments utilize in order to reduce power consumption, energy generation, and then more importantly, just increase a, a better life for everybody. And, and that's, that's what we do. Okay. Charlie, any comments in terms of uh, kind of a positive media spin on, on this industry? Uh, yeah, I mean, the one, there's, you know, it's a, it's a divisive topic. You've got federal and state ambiguity. Um, you've got political, or you've got um, um, uh, citizen support behind it. Um, the question around how does, you know, what does the federal crystal ball look like? Uh, I personally think this is going to become a, it's going to, it's going to be a, a topic in the next election in the sense that either a Democrat's going to make it a political issue or a Republican's going to take it completely off the table, which is going to solve the problem. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I think it's kind of vectoring in the right direction, um, and, and uh, Okay, we'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and vectoring in the right direction. Stacey, any comments? Well, I just kind of want to close with the keeping the eye on why we did this in the first place, right. and that is our streets are safer, our kids are safer. Um, we don't have the cartel in here um, doing, dealing drugs. Um, to our children, and um, you know the regulation it allows us to eliminate pesticides, uh, protect the landscape um, of our beautiful state, and I just think there's a million reasons, um, good social reasons why we should support this industry. Um, this, for me, has a name, and his name is Blake Crawford. He is um, one of my children's friends who was a co-ed down in Southern California 
good golfer, nicest kid you'd ever want to meet, and he happened to have a little pot in his dorm room that he would sell on occasion um, for pizza, etc. And um, <laughs> he was shot and killed for it. And so for me, um, this is a no-brainer. Uh, let's take the bad guys out of this picture. So I think that there's a really good social reason to get behind this industry, aside from the money. Yeah, I, I would agree, and that's one more point, and then we'll open it up for questions. I'm concerned about that activity happening and being spun the wrong way, and that is a dispensary gets knocked over and people working at the dispensary get hurt or worse. And the media is going to pick up on that as, oh, they're selling cannabis, marijuana, you know, it's, and, and, and I don't see how that's a positive spin. I doubt the media would pick up on that and say, well, you know what, if our federal regulations allowed these people to take cards and take cash out of the system, this would have been a much safer business to operate. That's not the story that gets spun. And so I'm, I'm kind of looking for ways to stay ahead of this or at least be able to step back from the sensationalist track that most media folks want to take and put this in a positive spin. I'm not saying everything about cannabis is positive and that everybody should ingest as much as they want. I think it, you know it's it's a, a self-regulated uh, business like like alcohol, like cigarettes, like anything else. Um, but I, I feel that that's kind of a responsibility that we can have as business people that are looking at a, at a, a business in its infancy uh, with huge growth potential. I think can benefit us. I, I, I would add really quickly on that on that point. I mean, you think about the different angles you can take, like veterans struggling with PTSD or job creation. Um, or you know opioid reductions in states that have legalized like you can take this from a number of different angles and the media is doing that the media is keenly interested you know we're, we're seeing a ton of interest in our business and the data that our software has about the industry from mainstream media outlets so I, I think that I think that the, the story and the attention is there um, and I think it's generally going to be favorable um, okay. for that reason okay. I, can, I can talk about that real quick so um, you guys ever read the magazine High Times? I had heard of it, been around for, for a while. Um, so just this last weekend in Sacramento, they, they put the first uh, recreational cannabis festival on. It's called Cannabis Cup. You get to grade other types of product and, and growers and get a real sense for it. Uh, I was there for the whole time, and let me tell you, it was amazing to see all the reporters that were there helicopters, everybody was there supporting it, the police were supporting it. Uh, mayor came out and was, was talking on stage about how great this is for the community and everything. I thought that was really awesome. And uh, you know, I watched some of the news the other night and, and uh, press went around a lot of the country on it, it was, it was all positive. You know, it wasn't just a, a bunch of people you know, doing bad things. These are people that got together to enjoy something that, that they're into and, and more importantly talk about how they can better the community and service. I met a lot of great businesses while I was there, and everybody really wants to make a difference and, and make change. So, and I appreciate you know, gentlemen coming over to that I invited from this festival to, to talk to us and, and learn more. So, great. I'd like to open it up to, to questions in the, in the crowd. We'll try to take as many as we can. In time. Yes. I have two immediate questions. So, you guys mentioned a lot of institutional capital and the reluctance and eagerness to invest. What about retail investors and using the Jobs Act, Title III and Title IV specifically, and opening that up to allow retail investors to get into the space? Do you have any thoughts? Have you seen anything on it? I can, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so, so part of why I got into blockchain was, was to cater to that retail investor. Somebody that just is never going to be able to have $100,000 to put into this but they may have $500 or $1,000, and that E-Trade account just doesn't have any listings like that. So how do you do that? And so for, for me, we've tokenized that piece, and so you come in, you can buy a token with a value that's everything I do is asset-backed. So your investment is based on whatever we tokenize, whether it be canvas or real estate or energy, whatever that is. And that's really gonna bring in billions of people that wanna come in and invest in this product, and, and we don't have to cater to a lot of institutional investors which sometimes, to be honest with you, that's that's half of my battle of my life is is trying to make these guys happy. And I'm like, this is a great investment. I'm really excited about it. And they're like, uh, I don't know. And then that kills your whole project. I'm sure any any entrepreneur here has had to deal with the committees or or somebody else that you go, why aren't you just saying yes? 
and write me a check, right? And and I think once once the retail market comes into play, that's really going to show that the power of the people is really there. Because right now, institutional money kind of controls a lot of the it big controls investors. everything. It's behind everything. It I is. mean, it's the illusion of retail investors, but you have the institutionals behind the scenes of everything. So I'm curious in this, because I look at Title III and it's an exemption to securities law where you could potentially use that space for funding for this. It's not as much access to capital, but it's interesting to see what you can legally do within that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm just going to keep going down the path we're in. And so my other question was to you, what blockchain protocol are you on? What you yeah, so, so we have proprietary blockchain, it's called Only. Okay. Uh, it's fantastic. It was actually created for the music industry. Okay. To uh, secure transmission of, of data from one place to another. More importantly, it was, it was created for a couple specific artists that got pirated. And so what we do is we blockchain the music, and then what's, what, what does everybody want when they create music? They want money. Right, whether you're a writer, producer, whatever. So, yeah, so all the royalties get logged in that blockchain and tokenized from that asset. From that asset. So we actually just got our first patent uh, two weeks ago for a smart contract. You know, we started that about four years ago. Yeah, it's a big deal for us. Um, but really, that's 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 what's going to change the market is and, and why we're we're fundable from a banking perspective is because we're not distributed ledger. You know, we, we don't we don't utilize Bitcoin and Ethereum uses a large amount of the world's power in order to complete transactions. We don't. Our system is based off of a, uh, basically like a treasury system that the U.S. government uses. We mint tokens. We have a treasury that verifies, and then we have an exchange that completes all the. You do a KYC, IML, all that. Yeah, stuff. That, that's all put in, and we take that information. We, our software company's been around for about five years, and we're connected to all the major C to sales systems to bring in that data. And you can't join our exchange unless. We do a full background check on you, and and we have it on you, and that all that information gets stored in the blockchain in order to ensure that that's compliant. Okay. And uh, yeah, so we couldn't do it with an Ethereum fork. Uh, that just we didn't find even the ERC two two three tokens weren't going to make sense for us to do that. And so I think uh, for us it's an elegant solution. Um, I don't I like reducing power. So if I made this awesome Ethereum coin that that sells billions of dollars worth every year, but I'm generate I'm using more energy than I really should be, that just would go against what we do. So so yeah, we can talk about it all, all day. Okay. Sure. Let's go to another question. Yeah, I have a question of, on insurance. Uh, I I've been in traditional large companies, and in fact, my last customer company, my biggest customers, we made a previous history alliance mm -hmm. and so forth. And I chatted, because we're starting a company, we're laying the cannabis, we don't touch the product. I talked to my brokers, and they said all of, all of our underwriters backed out, all the reinsurers have backed out, we have no one. And so you're gonna have to pay like three times what you used to pay. Is that, that was a month ago, is that still the same? <laughs> Not for us, because we have, we've shared what we know. And, and it's just about informing people. I mean, that's it, that's what it gets down to. So who's your reinsurer? I'd rather not say. <laughs> I'd rather not okay. say. But but um, but we have a good partnership. Okay. And we have people who are standing beside us um, and, uh, and are watching very carefully. I think that people are finding that this is exciting. And, and what you need to remember is, is that insurers are just people too. And um, when I get the phone call from the reinsurer whose brother has cancer and he's taking him down to the dispensary, um, I mean, it just takes, that's all it takes. Well, I have to talk. Truly, truly. Yeah. Um, I, just really quickly, I, have, uh, I want to know the name of your business again. I didn't catch it. The, Mine? Yeah, 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 yours. Yeah, it's, so it's Crypto Value Management System is the name of the company. Uh, our token's called ICE, which is In-State okay. Crypto Commodity Exchange. Okay. Okay. So I'm more than happy to give you a card and you can yeah. check it all out. So, so um, but I do have a question about insurance, so I just wanted to get your name. Um, um, so I, um, I work for a company uh, based in Mexico. Um, it's probably the second largest aggregator for credit cards. It's like Square in Mexico. Um, and um, we're thinking about crypto and all this other stuff like that. But some of the payments, um, like for example, from growers to um, workers would be considered illegal um, here in the United States. Uh, and I'm just curious about the insurance. Like when you're insuring a business, 
how deep do you go in kind of vetting them? Is it like, oh, you know, you get them to fill out a form and then, you know, you maybe do some kind of like, you know, basic like background check? Or are you really checking out their operations and if they're, you know, you know, maybe it's not just a dispensary, it's like a, you know, like it's cash bits. So are you, you know, imagine that they want to get insurance somehow. Are you like checking your code and all that stuff like that to, to, to check and see, you know, how, how deep does the due diligence go? Well, in, with respect to our underwriting protocols for cannabis operations, the one thing we knew out the gate was as long as we verified that the business was properly licensed, then all that background work oh, right. has been done for us. Because if they're licensed by their municipality, the police have been to that location, code enforcement has been to the location, the fire department has been to the location, all the um, venting has been cleared. Um, so a perfect client, actually. It, honestly, <laughs> honestly wow. it, it is um, a terrific risk. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns out there just because the claims haven't developed yet because um, the insureds haven't reported them. Either they didn't want anyone inspecting their facility or um, they just wanted to be under the radar. But um, we're going to see that change. We're prepared to pay those claims like any other business, like the liquor business. We do a lot of nutraceuticals and then um, nutritional subs, um, supplements, that kind of thing. It's the same thing. So we just need to get our head um, in the right place. Right. Emma is, is going to give me the hook here. Um, I just I just want a couple things. There's a couple people that just recently left and then we didn't get to shut the door and lock them in. But I, I think there's probably about 30 people here tonight, and it's 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 small based on one of our things, but Emma was, was one of the, the leaders in crypto, and she can talk about kind of the early audiences around Bitcoin uh, that she saw and, and the success that she's built for that. So I, I throw that challenge out to everybody that's here tonight, everybody that you know that's in this space, we're literally talking about billions and billions of dollars being generated that much of it doesn't really have a proper home from an investment perspective. There's there's a lot more on the outside of uh, VCs, institutional investments that are looking to figure out how do they grow in this business. They're not comfortable doing it. I think when we start changing those uh, those opinions uh, and the way people are doing business, this will be an even more interesting event. I hope we can do it annually. Yes, it'd be great to see uh, the change in the audience next year. Um, as Mark was saying, I had a Bitcoin panel in October to 2016. 25 people turned up in Menlo Park. We had a huge venue. Fabulous panel, 25 people. And the same with a blockchain panel in November. I held the same panels, different uh, panellists, in 2017, exactly the same time of year. And literally I had people forcing their way in the door, driving from San Francisco to Palo Alto, paying me in cryptocurrency, demanding to come in because they were on the wait list. We had people jammed up the halls. No one could hear. But, you know, and there was no in. Warriors playoff game either. <laughs> <laughs> it was outstanding. And I thought, gee, this is really different. <laughs> so I, I, that's why I called you all pioneers, that obviously this is the start of... Um, you know, legalization, and I think we're going to, we've heard from these incredible panelists, and I'm sure we're going to grow the business, hopefully. <laughs> so it would be good to check in in a year's time. Okay. I wanted to thank all the panelists. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs>